What is up? We are back to military history and film reviews here on Gear Issue 33. I know that it has been a while, but today we will be looking at one of my favorite films, Zulu, starring Stanley Baker and Michael Caine, released in 1964. It is a dramatization of the Battle of Rourke's Drift, a mission station held by the British during the opening days of the Anglo World War of 1879 and defended by less than 100 British troops, a good portion of which were sick and injured and were forced to hold off a force of an estimated total of 4,000 Zulu MP warriors. The battle would result in the rewarding of several Victoria Crosses, which will be the subject of a future video. This review will also not just speak about the battle at the mission station, but also the lead into the battle in the previous fight at Isla Moana, which was the subject of the sequel, which was also a prequel, Zulu Dawn, starring Peter O'Toole and Burt Lancaster. This project was actually uploaded six months ago, but due to YouTube's copyright terms, I was forced to remove it, but it gave me an opportunity to make a better version of this review. So if you notice little pictures as replacements to clips or even certain style backgrounds, and even my face while watching certain clips, just know that this area is being done to help make the video a little bit more transformative, so that way it will get through the copyright scheme. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and look at one of my favorite films, Zoom. <laughs> The film is set in 1879 during the British colonization of South Africa, and an unstable truce existed between the British and the Zulu, but peace was maintained as the British were allowed to continue their expansion into South Africa near Zululand. But this peace would be put to the test as soon as diamonds were discovered in the Natal region, Kimberley to be exact. Now, there is definitely a lot more to the Anglo-Boer Wars of 1879 than that, and that will be discussed in an official video that will actually detail every bit of the Anglo-Boer Wars more when we get into the actual history aspect of the channel. But at this point in time, the British did begin to reconsider their peace with the Zulu, and given their expansion and the potential wealth in the region, and after being pressed by white settlers on um, several occasions, by the way, amongst all the border clashes, the prospect of war was seen as inevitable. The British high commander, Sir Bottle Free, saw this as an opportunity and sent King Kitshweo of the Zulu an ultimatum of 13 turns with 20 days to respond. One of these conditions, which was a pretty big condition, was for the Zulu to end their regimental system and disband their army. The regimental system for the Zulu was pretty much their way of life and their actual governance. Now, I want you to think of the Zulu as Africa's version of the Spartans. The Zulu used this regimental system to not only recruit men into their army, but it was pretty much their culture as a people. And the thinking at the time was that if the Zulu were to reject this offer, or if they did not answer within the time frame, then it would give the British the opportunity to actually go in, or better word would probably be excuse. The king, however, saw the situation after being essentially told these terms as a desperate measure, and given all the things that were going around at the time, even the king had no intention of crossing the Buffalo River in the Natal region to actually face the British, and he was actually looking for a potential political solution, but we will get to that a little bit closer towards the end of the video, so make sure you guys sit tight and stick around. I saw! After the announcements were made, preparations were obviously made by both the Zulu and the British. But I want to focus in on the Brits as we head into Isla just for a quick second. Lord Kelmsford felt that the Zulu would not want to engage in an open fight, and he felt the guerrilla tactics was what would be used against them. The objective was to get the Zulu to fight out in the open, and uh, shortly after he crossed the Buffalo River from the mission station at Jork's Drift, uh, he divided his force into three columns with himself leading the main one. This tactic, of course, was questioned given the fact that they were actually going into Zululand and weren't exactly as familiar with the land as, say, the Boers were in their border clashes. But, of course, British press, they did go along with him. And this clip, I think, sums up exactly the tactics that were being questioned. Drummed into my thick skull that a good commander never willingly splits his force, especially in an enemy's country, before knowing their dispositions. Ah, uh, yes, if we were facing a European enemy armed with guns, I think your point would hold, Nogs. Further, may I remind you, I do not create the strategies you wish to comment on. I'm only his lordship secretary. Now, of course, due to copyright, I went ahead and put a header over that, but there were other tactics that were actually questioned in the aftermath of Issa Alwana. Now, I'm going to be very, very brief with Issa Alwana, but uh, the point is I want to go ahead and kind of explain what was going on here so that way you guys can kind of see what the setup was going into the Battle of Warwick's Drift. 
Now, one of the things that was questioned was Kelmsford's uh, refusal to entrench his men, especially when they got to the campment at the hill below Isanawana. And at around 11 a.m. on the morning of January 22nd, a scouting party under Lieutenant Rawls would spot a pretty large Zulu force, pretty much the entire army that was on its way to face the British near that position around Isanawana. And while the British would eventually hastily put together a defense force after discovering that the Zulu were on their way, this defense force under Colonel Pauline, who wasn't exactly known for strategy, let's just say that the Zulu had found a way to outmaneuver Lord Kelmsford. The Zulu would, of course, attack the encampment, the men who were under extreme duress, the Brits, of course, they had a hell of a time trying to defend this position. And the Zulu, of course, would continue this attack, completely routing this force of an estimated total of right around 1,800 and killing what's believed to be 1,300 British soldiers, including 52 officers. And while it is believed that the British killed somewhere between 1,500 to 3,000 Zulu, the fight was still seen as an embarrassment for the British and considered to be the worst defeat in British colonial history. Lord Kelmsford would arrive after the battle and after witnessing the post-fight carnage, he was absolutely horrified by what he saw and, of course, exactly how much he had underestimated the Zulu. It's time to save the colors. Get to Rock's Drift. You must warn them. The colors... Now, before we get to Rourke's Drift, I want to establish a couple of points before we get into the battle itself. The film does a really good job of being fair to both sides, and some people do believe that it was due to the fact that the film was being made during the Civil Rights Movement here in the U.S., but uh, I'll hold up on that for now, but certain scenes illustrate this. For example, the explanation of Isanawana or the outcome of Isanawana from the Boer Scout Corporal Aidenhoff. Make sure you guys... Uh, there were 400 native levies also. Damn the levies, man. They're more cowardly blacks. You mean cowardly blacks? They died on your side, didn't they? This is actually true because many of the men who died at Isanawana fighting with the British were also black natives in the Natal region, but that right there will be discussed in a different video. What do you know about Zulus? Bunch of savages, isn't it? <laughs> All right. How far can you run next march in a day? Oh, 15, 20 miles, is it? Well, a Zulu regiment can run. Run 50 miles and fight a battle at the end of it. As you saw with Jish, there's always a person to correct the individual on the nature of the Zulu. The thing that you have to understand is that the Zulu weren't just common savages. They were a respected and feared tribe. Go back to what I said about them basically being the Spartans of Africa. Another thing to point out, by the way, if you've seen both films, you don't get the impression, or at least I didn't, that either side was actually the bad guy, especially in Zulu Dawn. I actually found the, the Zulu to be quite sympathetic in the latter. Now, the film condenses a lot of the planning, but still gets a lot of it right. For example, Chard, knowing the incoming Zulu would, uh, let's just say, he knew that they would be able to engulf them in if it was an open uh, fight, especially given the fact that there were a lot of sick and wounded. However, the thing is this right here. Chard understood the location that he was at, and it was actually an idea that was pressed to him by James Langley Dalton, who was the acting assistant commissary. So the consensus basically was to defend the outpost because, of course, if the men decided to get up and leave, uh, due to the fact that they were mostly sick and wounded, a smaller force, the belief was that the Zulu would eventually catch up to them. Now, one of the things they chose to do was use anything and everything they could for barriers, crates, wagons, anything they could find, spare beds. And of course, so, a lot of this was obviously the army doesn't like more than one disaster in a day. Zulu. Looks now, bad in the newspaper. Before I go any further, I want to play this right here for you guys. It's basically an explanation of the horns of the buffalo, but of course there's going to be headers over the top of it and I will be giving you guys another explanation of it on the other side to kind of help break it down a little bit further and explain why it was effective at Isan Wana, but why it would not be effective here at Rourke's Drift. The classical attack of the Zulus is in the shape of a fighting bull buffalo like this. The head, the horns, and the loins. First the head moves forward, and the enemy naturally moves in to meet it. But it's only a feint. The warriors in the head then disperse to form the encircling horns, and the enemy is drawn in on the loins. And the horns close in on the back and sides. Basically, the idea is for the force and defense to strike the head while the horns engulf and surround the enemy. And, uh, of course, after engulfing the enemy, eventually what would happen is essentially what 
ends up happening is that uh, the force that's in defense, uh, they are pretty much surrounded. Eventually, the loins or the back end eventually fully engulf the troops in the middle. That's actually how they would win their fights, especially the fight it's on one itself. Men and it would obviously a turn out this that morning. in this case, what with, uh, we with Griff, the defense stuff that they have would actually uh, disable the horns of the buffalo. Now, whether the uh, Zulu knew how to fight uh, in any other formation other than the uh, horns of the uh, buffalo, that right there is a topic for the day. But I wanted to establish this and this film here so that way you guys kind of knew that the... Um, Let's just say that the defense at Rourke's Drift was not exactly the most dire of situations. It looks that way on the surface, but when you actually break it down, it's actually quite advantageous for Char to have the position that he did. I'm with Chuck. All right. What's the date of your commission? Now, don't tell me. I suppose you have seniority. 1872, May. 1872, February. Oh, well, I suppose there are such things as gifted amateurs. If I'm Are you questioning my right to command? Oh, not your right, old boy. Never mind. We can cooperate. Now, there is one more inaccuracy that I do want to get out of the way before we go any further, and that is the command. And what I mean by the command is the scene involving uh, Bromhead and Chard having a conversation about who should be in charge. I'll play the clip for you guys with headers over it here in a second because even though it's a good scene in the film, it more than likely never occurred. The truth be told is this here. The drift itself had actually been under the command of Major Spalding, who had actually departed to nearby help Makar, and he placed uh, Lieutenant Chard uh, actually in command of the remaining men at the mission itself. Something else, too, that needs to be said is that this scene was probably placed here to add uh, to the heightened overall drama. Bromhead himself, by the way, in the film played by Michael Caine, played wonderfully by Michael Caine, uh, is quite pompous, but in reality, over the course of the film, you see that he actually... Let's just say that there are certain scenes where he doesn't seem too sure of himself or too sure of the overall situation, but he kind of plays up to being a bit of a pompous prick. Something else, too, that needs to be said is that uh, Chard had actually been in the British Army a little bit longer, and Bromhead was three years his junior. Another thing that needs to be said is that uh, Gonville Bromhead himself was actually deaf in one ear, and it's, um, I'll put it this way here, a lot of his men actually felt that it was no coincidence that they had been put at the rear. But still, for the purposes of the film, Michael Caine played this character perfectly, and of course, obviously, he's playing the character he's been given. So, if you think that Bromhead is a little bit pompous, yes, that was obviously the design of it, and of course, Bromhead, over the course of the film, looks like he's not exactly sure of himself. But, if you pay attention to scenes, especially scenes where they're actually engaged with the Zulu, he almost comes like a like a pure freaking badass. If anybody in this film's character actually grew, it was definitely Gonville Bromhead's. Oh, wait, I forgot one last thing. Jack Hawkins' character, Otto Witt. Now, Otto Witt, in reality, was actually a 30-year-old man who actually supported the incursion into Zululand, mostly for missionary reasons, but once again, this where will come up in a much, much larger take on the uh, Boer Wars or the Anglo-Boer Wars of South Africa between the British and, the, and Zulu uh, a little bit later on in another video in the future, especially when we go more to pure military history. Uh, as far as the battle itself, I'm going to go ahead and say this now, and of course there's going to be another video a little bit later on, and I'm definitely going to be discussing it more in the film, and of course, over the course of this review, i got to mention the 11 Victoria Crosses. Uh, some of the men who obviously got Victoria Crosses included James Langley Dalton, who is of course portrayed as the man in black. Of course, Bromhead and, of course, Lieutenant Chard also got Victoria Crosses as well, but we'll come back to that a little bit later on in the film. But I wanted to go ahead and establish that uh, Jack Hawkins' character, the character he's portraying, Otto Witt, was not a drunk, and nor was he actually a coward, nor was he in his 50s. With that right there said, now let's go ahead and get to the battle. <laughs> Shortly before the battle, after all the defenses were set up, a little bit later on that afternoon, right around 3.30, a mixed group of Natal horsemen show up to the station, having retreated from nearby Isla The film portrays these men as cowards who just simply took off and left, and they thought that the men who were defending the drift were absolutely crazy. However, in reality, what really happened was these cavalrymen would actually uh, go to the hill overlooking the position right there at, right there at uh, Rourke's Drift in nearby Xi'an. 
The Zulu, however, they would arrive at roughly 4.30 that afternoon. They began to probe the British defenses, first engaging uh, the Natal horse. Now, in the film, it is shown that the Zulu would go ahead and uh, launch somewhat of a, um, how do I say this, somewhat of a uh, non-focused attack, basically just a good old-fashioned movement towards the British. And, of course, uh, it's basically played off as if to say that they were trying to see exactly how many men were there. They didn't have a full number. If you remember the scene, you have Aiden Hoff actually actually explaining what's going on. And, of course, the next set of attacks would occur over the course of the uh, following uh, the rest of the film. However, there are also scenes of Zulu on the nearby hill taking pot shots at the British soldiers. Now, there has been some controversy over this, but let me just go ahead and say that the Zulu had picked up spare martini rifles the day before from Issa al Now, the Zulu that attacked Rorik's Drift were actually a rear guard force, but we'll discuss that more towards the end of the film. But they had picked up rifles from nearby Isanawana the previous day's fight, and they were firing at the British. However, the effectiveness, on the other hand, is not entirely accurate as far as uh, what you see in the film. It's widely believed that the, um, the pot shots that were taken from hundreds of yards away weren't effective at all. But Zulu had gotten a hold of the martini rifles or spare martini rifles. And of course, they also had some rifles of their own. I just figured I would go ahead and point that out before we go any further. The first charge, the Zulu obviously break through. They get through to the camp. And of course, the fighting eventually goes to hand to hand. You see scenes of obviously Color Sergeant Bourne. He's obviously throwing bayonet shots. Of course, that uh, one of the Zulu, I talked about Bromhead earlier in his performance. And eventually you get the scene where... Uh, Char doesn't exactly look too good in the scene. I'll just leave it right here. I'm assuming that everybody's watching the video and not just uh, hearing my voice. But obviously, the film decided to take an amalgamation of all of the, uh, let's just say, all of the day's action and kind of include them into two separate strikes. There's even some good old-fashioned volley fire here. Now, I'm going to be bringing volley fire up again towards the end of the review because I'm going to be needing to use another film to explain to you guys exactly how effective British volley fire was. Volley fire, by the way, was the technique that actually helped secure the British Empire. So just fair go ahead and point that out. Another thing, too, that I need to go ahead and point out is obviously the attack on the hospital and, of course, the cattle being used. Now, the cattle use actually had occurred at night when the fighting actually got to the nighttime, which I'm going to go ahead and play a small sequence from a separate documentary that I picked up on this fight for you guys so that way you guys can kind of see what I mean. And after all that, probably the best sequence of the film was the hospital fight. Now, if you've seen the film, then you would obviously know about Private uh, Alfred Henry Hook or his portrayal. We'll talk more about him towards the end of the film. But uh, Chard had realized that the North Wall was under constant attack from the Zulu and it could not be held. So at right around 6 p.m., he pulled his men back into the yard, abandoning the front two rooms of the hospital in the process. The movie showcases the hospital burning down during the day and of course it continuing through the night. But uh, as the hospital burns, some of the sequence in the film is a bit condensing of what Private Henry Hook does do. Not just himself, but several others. It's also the stuff that many of these men got their their Victoria Crosses for. The hospital was becoming basically untenable. The loopholes had become a liability. And what I mean by the loopholes is they were obviously the holes that men had poked into the wall. So that way they could have some form of cover and concealment while firing at the incoming Zulu. As the rifles themselves were poking out, they were also being grabbed by the Zulus who had still not been shot somehow or another. Of course, they were very slippery and extremely skilled. And of course, a lot of these holes just simply left empty. The Zulu warriors stuck their own weapons through in order to fire into the rooms, those who did actually have rifles and those who were picking up rifles off the few dead that were around there. Now, among the soldiers that were assigned to the hospital, this right here included Corporal William Wilson Allen, Privates Cole, Dunbar Hitch, Horgan, John Williams, Joseph Williams, Alfred Henry Hook, as mentioned before, Robert Jones, and also William Jones. Low on Henry rifle pellets, uh, which, by the way, was the rifle ammunition that they were using at the time, the topic of the video, they decided to go ahead and switch to their revolvers. Privates Horgan, Williams, Joseph Williams, and other patients tried to hold the hospital entrance with bayonets and revolvers. Joseph Williams defended a small small window, and 14 dead Zulu were later found uh, beneath uh, said window. As it became uh, pretty clear... Uh, that the front of the building was being overtaken by the Zulu, and eventually uh, the men escaped out the back. The film makes up with this with the overall fight sequence and, of course, the burning of the actual hospital itself. 
Now, after the second Zulu charge, this right here to me, I felt was actually the best fight sequence in the film. The film also gives us a much, much, uh, let's just say a much, um, it's a much, much more memorable scene with the hospital burning down during the day. But of course, this actually happened during the night. But we'll be talking a little bit more towards the end of the film, especially when we start to talk about Alfred Henry Hook. Them. Rourke's drift had been turned into something of a slaughterhouse. There were great heaps of Zulu bodies piled up against the barricades, particularly in front of the hospital, which had been charged over time and time again. Now, Chard says that in the immediate aftermath of the fight, they buried something like 350 bodies in front of the post. But he admitted later... The film chose to condense all the fighting at night. And, of course, I just showed you guys a documentary clip, of course, of exactly what was going on through the night. It was a hell of a fight. And, of course... The overall casualty count, which if you go to Wikipedia, doesn't match what was actually found, but we'll get to that here in a second. Now, there is one more thing that needs to be discussed before we go any further, and of course, I'm going to play some of this for you guys with headers over it, and that right there would be the sequence of the men singing uh, Men of Harlech. <laughs> Stop your dreaming. Can't you see their spear points gleaming? See their warrior pennon streaming to this battle field. Sing. Now, the reason why I want to include this in was obviously because of the final attack. The final attack sequence is masterful. And once again, you guys see the, uh, the brilliance of volley fire. Now, I'm going to show you guys a sequence from the film Last of the Mohicans, which was a deleted scene. Now, I've got to show very, very small bits of it because of copyright, but volley fire was the technique that helped the British Army secure the empire that they would hold for so long. It's something that they quite frankly mastered, and you guys obviously see it, uh, for the most part, on full display here in the film Zulu. However, here's the thing about that. More than likely, this scene and this sequence never occurred. The following morning, the Zulu were basically cutting bait and saying the hell with this and getting the hell out of Dodge. But of course, it does make for a wonderful scene right here at the end of the film uh, where the uh, British soldiers, of course, are just kind of going over the damage, surveying everything. And of course, you get the magnificent scene of the Zulu showing up to, uh, well, let me just play it. They're taunting us. <laughs> Couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> they saluting you. <laughs> this right here is many people, many fans of the film's favorite scene. But in point of fact, it more than likely never occurred. I squatted down on a hill opposite. Then, after some time, they rose as one and went away. The popular belief that the Zulu was saluting the Redcoats is unlikely to be true. After Isawana, Kashwayu was getting information of a victory from his forces. They had just defeated the British. However, the thing is this here. Kashwayu did not want a full-blown conflict. He wanted a victory so that way he could negotiate from a uh, much, much stronger diplomatic position. The force that attacked Rourke's Drift that day was actually a reserve force uh, with a mixed bag of older and much, much younger warriors that were not that, uh, not that experienced. They almost equated to pretty much a reserve force. And to go on top of that, uh, King Cashwell, like I said before, he didn't want a full-blown conflict. He wasn't entirely sure that the Zulu could win, and he definitely did not want to lose his people, his way of life, or anything of that sort there. So for the most part, King Cashwell was just looking for a good old-fashioned victory so that way he could renegotiate his position with the British. That's really what he wanted. Now, there's one more thing that I want to talk about before I get to the final section, and that right there is the casualty figures. Now, from the battle itself, the casualty figures sometimes fluctuate a little bit, depending on who you ask. Like, let me give you an example of what I mean. If you go to Wikipedia, you would see that the numbers, uh, as I'm editing this uh, review, the overall numbers were, for the British, 17 dead and uh, 15 wounded. The Zulu numbers, however, range between 500 and 700, but 351 confirmed dead and 500 wounded. That being said... Subsequent weeks and months. And in fact, there are some quite reliable statistics which suggest that something like 600 Zulus were actually killed at the Battle of Rourke's Drift. 
Now, on top of that, of course, you've got a, an unknown number of wounded. Even if there were only three or four hundred wounded on the top, which would be a very small proportion, you're looking at something like a thousand men who sustained a wound in action. Well, we said earlier that there were only about 4,000 Zulus who took part in the fight. So it means that something like one in four Zulus who took part in the fight sustained some sort of injury. And there are some very graphic accounts, actually, which suggest that even men who survived sustained two, three, or even four wounds and then were helped away by their comrades and somehow... Obviously, more bodies would be found amongst the wreckage. Now, with that being said, I want to go over the Victoria Cross winners just for a brief moment. And like I said before, there'll be another video detailing it more and more what happened after the men uh, would eventually leave the field of battle in another video. But let's go ahead and go through this. Lieutenant John Rouse Marriott Chard, 5th of... Uh, 5th Field Company, Royal Engineers, Lieutenant Gonfal Bromhead, Bravo Company, 24th 2nd Warwickshire uh, Regiment of uh, Foot, uh, Corporal William uh, Wilson Allen, Bravo Company, 24th Foot, uh, Private uh, Frederick Hitch, Bravo Company, 2nd uh, 24th uh, Foot. By the way, all these men were 2nd 24th Foot. Uh, Private Alfred uh, Henry Hook, uh, Private uh, Robert Jones, Private William Jones, Private John Williams, Surgeon General Major James Henry Reynolds, Army Medical Department, Acting Assistant Commissary James Langley Dalton, commiss uh, Commissariat and Transport Department, and Corporal Christian Ferdinand Gies, uh, Second, Third uh, Natal Native Contingent. Now, in 1879, there was no provision for posthumous granting of the Victoria Cross, and so it could not be awarded to anyone who had died performing an act of bravery. Private Joseph B. Williams uh, would have actually qualified. Now, like I said before, most of the men that I just mentioned now, we will be talking about in a separate video, and of course they were also featured in smaller parts of the film. The person that I think kind of got the short end of the stick, however, is uh, James Langley Dalton, the man in black. He actually was much, much more important in the actual planning of this battle than people might would want to give him credit for, but the film definitely kind of glossed over that. However, I got to get to my favorite characters from the film, and obviously the first person you're thinking about is probably uh, Color Sergeant Bourne. Hayden. He's... Mr. Witt says... Never mind him. While some of this, of course, does have headers over it, of course, the reason why is to avoid copyright, but him calming down another soldier kind of encapsulates what the color sergeant was. By the way, the color sergeant in reality was actually a lieutenant colonel, uh, Frank Bourne, but like I said, we'll mention it. We'll talk more about him in another video. But the scene, of course, where you see him calming down this uh, young soldier, of course, is the sequence where he's talking to uh, Reverend Witt, who was obviously portrayed to be a drunk and a bit of a coward in the film. Now, obviously, this prayer was not, uh, was not true of Witt. Like I said before, we'll discuss him in another video. But there is one more character that I do want to discuss in this. Hey! Hook's portrayal was probably the worst uh, mischaracterization out of all the men there. As a matter of fact, it is said, and uh, <laughs> I had to do some uh, serious digging, it was actually said that... Uh, his descendants when they actually saw the film were uh, a little bit upset about the actual portrayal um hook was obviously portrayed to be a malingerer sick drunk anything you can come up with obviously a scumbag but as you guys obviously saw with the hospital sequence he was probably the biggest hero in the entire group i mean the way the film characterizes it he's the man who actually saved pretty much everybody's uh behind in the actual film itself but of course if you actually look into what he wanted victoria cross for you'd probably come away with the exact same feeling truth be told is like i mentioned before and i remember seeing this film for the first time back in 1999 on a e yes i am that old he was my favorite character my thinking is that the writers wanted him uh, to be kind of that character that grows the most but as i mentioned before the person that actually grew the most over the course of the film, at least as far as my perspective is concerned, is Gonville Bromhead. As I mentioned before, he's quite pompous at the very beginning. And eventually, over the course of the film, you get to see that he's not really that sure of himself. And of course, during the fight itself, he ends up turning to uh, one hell of a badass. Now, we will discuss James Langley Dalton a lot more, and we'll also discuss Frederick Gies a lot more, especially when we get to much, much deeper... Uh, topics on the Anglo-Zulu Wars, which, by the way, I want to go ahead and say right now, 
this right here is a channel that's going to be discussing military films and, of course, historical. And, of course, this also includes films that are not historically accurate. Like, for example, the next video that comes out is going to be about the film The Beast of War, just which basically is going to be discussing everything. But eventually, we are going to go into full-blown military history. And speaking of that right there, there is one scene that has always jumped out at me as a veteran myself, and it's this one. Hughes? Yes, Color Sergeant. Say, sir. Hit. Hitch, I saw you. You're alive. Sir. All right. Now get off into the sick bag where you belong. Hook. Yes, sir, me too, sir. There you are, Hook. The roll call scene at the end, I think, uh, encapsulates everything that a veteran, especially a combat, uh, combat veteran, would have to go through, at least as far as the mentality is concerned. The last thing uh, you want to have is during a roll call, somebody who doesn't answer. And what I mean by that is somebody who does not actually answer the call. More times than not, that means that said individual lost their life during the course of the fight. That's something that, quite frankly, scares the living hell out of anybody who is actually serving along said individual, especially their platoon sergeant or their platoon commander. Uh, it's almost why it is if you're somebody who, say, as a staff NCO or an NCO or definitely an officer, you probably can relate with the color sergeant with this scene here. Yeah. Well, guys, that right there about wraps it up. Uh, now, look, I'll be exploring more facts about the battle and the Victoria Cross winners in a future film and probably more about the uh, 1879 Anglo-Boer Wars in the future, but also all wars as well. If you guys liked this video, make sure you guys please hit that like button. Please subscribe to the channel as well, seeing as this is the direction that we're going to be going into. If you found it uh, entertaining or informative, please, guys, leave a comment in the comment section. I would love to get you guys' take on this. If you have an honest-to-God critique, uh, please leave it in the comments, and uh, I'll see you guys soon.